Hey, Dr. Belkir's talk yesterday. It was worthwhile. Yeah. yeah it's great. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that for future years as well. He also asked me to let you know his email address, Belkir at master.ca. Uh, if you want to contact him beforehand, the questions are ready for him. The other thing I want to mention is that he's teaching a course next term, which is, um, depending on your schedule, you may or may not be interested in. I believe it is available to undergraduates to take. Uh, it's in the School of Engineering Practice, so it's an SP course, 770. Uh, don't let the 7 scale you. It's a course though by sustainability management. And uh, one of the problems is that in the course is to use, to consider that idea of entrepreneurship as a way to enforce sustainability or bring sustainability into a number of companies and, and processes where they are not currently sustainable. So coming up with innovative small companies to make the big companies realize they're not operating in a small, in a sustainable way. And, and so he's considering some of those issues in that course and in the future. So that's something that you can see that maybe worthwhile looking into that as something that you can pick up. So please uh, feel free to email him. So we're going to get started then on operability today. So what do the following words have in common? something I can hope to explain to you and give you a very concise meaning about it. But what we will do is we will have a definition later on that is, is fairly concise. It may not make sense to you now, but hopefully in a few days time after a few of these classes we will get a better understanding of what operability is. Another way to take a look at it is to see it's kind of like the how things work for ChemEng. We, up to now in, in your courses that you've taken in undergraduate, We've learned about fluid flow, thermodynamics, heat transfer, reactor design, separation processes, maybe the stats we've taken, stats course, uh, all those core engineering concepts. But we haven't really learned how to make something work. It's the equivalent of, as, a, as I've been saying to a few of the groups um, in the SDL meetings, it's the equivalent of being told, um, well, a car has four wheels, steering wheel, a, an engine, uh, a brake, a pedal, a couple of doors. But that's not going to make a car, right? I mean, that's pretty much Henry Ford's Model T. But it's not a practical car that's operable. Okay, so up to now, you've learned how to design the engine. You've learned what the, the motor and uh, the brake and the gas pedal do, what the steering wheel does. You've learned those equivalents of chemical engineering. We haven't really learned how to make this car work. How do you make it so that it can take a corner at high speed? What are some of the things that you add to the car to make um, it drive safely on an icy road? Um, make even small minor things like heated car seats and a rear view mirror that dims when there's high beams coming from the car behind you. Um, some nice features that you get on some of the upper scale cars are if you put the car in reverse, the, the side mirrors tilt so you can see the sidewalk, so you don't drive your wheel up. Little things like that that make it a pleasure to drive that car, that make that car operable, and make it fun to drive, that make your chemical process, the equivalent of making your chemical process, easy to operate day to day. So that something minor doesn't cause the whole thing to shut down, that you can keep going, that you can operate when there's a rainstorm, or a super hot sunny day, when your cooling water is now, instead of the usual 20 degrees, it's now 25 degrees. Or in winter time, when your cooling water is now down to 15 or 10 degrees C, can your process still operate? Okay. So we're going to do the equivalent of taking a car that we know the basic components, but how do we make that thing actually work and make it a pleasure and easy and economical and profitable and safe to operate? 
Okay, so we're going to do, learn about the equivalent of that on a chemical process. <coughs> so a number of groups have been saying and looking at the SDL projects and they've been finding flow sheets online for different processes. And sometimes you're kind of surprised. Like, why would a company even publish their flow sheets online? You get block flow diagrams. Sometimes you even get flow rates and pressures and temperatures of the streams, the molar compositions. And you're like, wow, why is a company giving away all this proprietary information? They're not really giving anything away. What they've given away is essentially told you, well, it's the equivalent of a car having four wheels, a steering wheel, a couple of doors, a brake pedal, a gas pedal. They haven't really told you anything. It's just kind of giving you the essential block flow diagram. But how you make that plant actually work and make it functional is, is, the, real, is the real engineering side of things. Um, where your knowledge of fluid flow, your knowledge of process control in particular, your knowledge of thermodynamics, all of these things are going to come together now and we're going to see, let's make this plant actually work in a smooth manner that's safe to operate day to day um, and easy to operate and profitable. And will work <coughs> under a variety of conditions that we have to, have to face. Same idea as like you have to drive the car in snow, in the, in the heat of the summer, all those conditions that you face, you have to be able to operate that car. We, we want to do the same with our chemical products <coughs> and a variety of conditions. So today's class, we're going to really just get into the topic of operability. Only next class will we actually start to look at some of the details. Today's class, we're just going to understand how do we design our processes. So we're essentially going to look at what we've done and learned in ChemEng so far. How we go about the sequence of designing the process. And we're going to also identify in the second half of the class today what our sources of variability are. Okay. Then in the next class, we're going to learn how to engineer the process to accommodate for those sources of variation. But we're going to do this on the example of this ethylene plant that I handed out to you. What I also want you to do is bear in mind your SDL project. How would you apply the same ideas we're going to learn today and we're going to just do it on this case study. I've chosen this because no one in the class has an ethylene plant. So how are we going to apply this topic from ethylene plants and looking at sources of variation and apply it to your own group project? So have that in mind over the next few classes. Okay, so always the rhetorical question, is a design complete when we have the solution for the base case mass and energy balance? So you've done your mass and energy balance, either using the ideas from your second year course, this weak cycle streams, you've got your block flow diagrams. Is that process design complete? Can you build that plant and operate it? <coughs> no. And that's clear. Um, so what, what's going to go wrong? What's, why can we not build that plant from that base case? deviations from the base case, what are those deviations going to cause? We're going to see those variations lead to other variations in, in the downstream streams, it could lead to safety issues, uh, it could lead you to making products that are not at this base case specifications that you require. We're wanting our outputs to be fairly consistent. You don't want to sell your, pro your customer product that's all over the map. So you want that despite all these issues coming in, we still want to operate our process safely. We want to be reliable. We want our process to be able to operate reliably. So can we pick instrumentation? Can we pick our flow sheet structure so that we get reliability built in into the flow sheets? Um, can we still meet our required production quantities and specifications? And there's going to be a few other issues that come up there. Okay, so here's this concise definition of process operability. I'll give you a, a minute to read it. Make, does it make sense to you? They're in blue. Sense. All right, so this is 
quite a, it's a hard, hard topic to define. A lot of long words in there. Capacity, flexibility, what exactly do we mean by that? A range of operating conditions, that's fairly clear. Reliability, how do we quantify reliability? What does that mean? Profitability, we have a good sense of that already from, this, from the course so far. Good dynamic performance, what is, what is that all about? That, there's obviously some stuff there related to your uh, 3P course, your sort of post control, uh, dynamic performance, um, and if you take the post course, you would also look at dynamics of the process, and product quality. So there's a lot of these concepts that we've learned in other courses in here coming together. So many people use this term robust design as, a, as an alternative for process operability. So in your experience so far, what do you take the word robust to mean? Something is robust. It doesn't fail. The outputs are resistant to change. Outputs are resistant to change. It doesn't easily break down. It doesn't break down. So if you're buying a used car, you want that used car or a new car, even the brand that you pick or the, the features that you pick, you want that to be robust. Uh, is a is a is one way maybe to describe what you want from it. It doesn't break down. It's easy to operate. Um, so it's a similar meaning to this topic of operability is ro robust design. So we'll come back to this at the end of the, of, after the few classes, and then when you read this definition then um, at the end, it'll make a lot more sense to you what, what we're getting at. So here's a, here's a one way to, to see what, where we're going. Um, as you start to look at, at flow sheets, especially the more detailed PID diagrams, you're going to see things along this line. So here's four options to achieve the same goal. We want to regulate flow. That's our goal, simply to regulate the flow. Here's four particular options. Which one of those is cheapest? Okay, it's definitely, it's got your flow meter and you've got your pneumatic valve. Simple. So it's a simple process in terms of simplicity and cost. Is it reliable? It's all flexible. No? It's being shaken, why not? Why isn't it reliable? <coughs> so if that valve breaks or the, or the flow meter breaks, you're, you're, you've lost lost that ability to regulate the flow. Um, what, what is option B doing to improve that? There's a manual bypass. There's a bypass over here. And how is that going to help for reliability? Well, if the valve goes down, you can send it around the other way, or if the valve needs to be serviced, you can cut it off. And Exactly right. So as you, as if this valve needs servicing, and it often does, pneumatic valves up will will fail. They're 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 used in feedback control systems, so they're automatically open and closed. But after a period of time, they will fail. They absolutely will fail. And if this is the valve that's coming to your distillation column, we've got a few other units here, but this is the valve we're referring to over here. If that valve fails, you don't want to shut down your entire distillation column to just maintain it. Okay, so we want a method to say, well, hang on, this one is known to fail. It guaranteed within a year or two it's going to break down. Whatever the service, whatever the lifetime is, when we get to the topic of reliability, we'll quantify. Um, and we've got methods to quantify the life, expected lifetimes of these. But guarantee in the lifetime of the plant, this will fail several times. And you don't want to shut down this unit and in the downstream units from it just to service that valve, which may take three, four hours. The purpose of a third valve in the top line. This one here? Yeah. It's so that you can, if I'm, if I'm closing this one, 
and I'm bypassing, yeah, I don't want the material to come back at the while I'm servicing the valve. So I close both, now I've got this pipe isolated and I can <coughs> fix that pneumatic valve. Well. Option C. There's no flow measurement, so it's not, it doesn't have that uh, feedback to us over there. Maybe the flow measurement is elsewhere. So, but we, we definitely don't have any flow on that, so it's definitely going to be cheaper than some of the other options. One of the other things to realize about these pneumatic valves is that they don't often close 100% shut. So if we do need to take this line down with just this valve, we're going to still get material coming through here. Some, some drips or but some movement, these valves never seep off. Uh, so they're, 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 rate, they're good regulators, they can open and close and provide a regulator stream, but they're not fully shut or fully, uh, well, they can obviously be open, but fully shut, they will never give you a good seal. So you can say, well, we want to periodically take this line downstream here and close it off. Let's add a, a manual valve up there. And then option D is like the gold plated version where you've got all of that and redundancy. Okay, so, so for something as simple as this, we can already start to see we're trading off between cost, simplicity, reliability, and, and the flexibility we have to operate our process. As one of the groups said in my, in my meetings yesterday, I think it was he said, well, wherever we see a valve now, let's go ahead and replace it with four valves. No, you don't want to do that. You don't go say, well, wherever I've got a, a feedback control valve, I'm going to go implement option B. Okay, that cost is going to just go up and up and up. What we, we do is we use it where appropriate. So here, you find the distillation column definitely appropriate. But if this valve is still a regular to feed valve, but it comes to a tank with, which has level control, we may have the, the opportunity to service that valve without having a bypass because we've got some built-in inventory here that we can draw down on before um, running run dry. So it's not always a given that you just go ahead and, and implement option B everywhere. Okay, so we do need to start to think about some of these um, as we look at our questions. So, so here, well, we're going to, yeah, let me skip over this. I've already mentioned this. This is what we're going to cover in the class today. Let's take a look now at what we've learned so far in CAMH. And I want you to see this in the context of the, the ethylene plants in front of you. If you were to take this flow sheet that you have over there. I'd like you to think a bit about it for a minute here. We've got our feed stream, which is the hydrocarbon stream. And our intended aim is to end up with products that are ethylene. So primarily an ethylene stream over there that we can then sell. And that can get used to make polymers and, and other products. So very flexible raw material for a number of other industries. So we're taking our hydrocarbon stream as our feed, and we would like to end up with that as my product. <clears throat> we'll get the middle part right now. Consider then the goal and the design specification. What would be the goals? What would the goals have to look like? What would you write down if you were planning to build a flow sheet? What would you want to write down as your goals and specifications? What would they look like? What would you want to know, in other words? We obviously don't just say, well, here's a hydrocarbon stream and we're going to convert it to ethylene. We need, you want some more information. What is that information that we require to be more clear so that by the end we can end up with a well-designed flow sheet? But what is it that we specifically need to, to answer those goals and those design specifications? Suggestions?
Anything else you want to know of it? For you're getting into the floor sheets already. <laughs> Is some sort of like environmental effect or how to store it? How to store products and feed. The environmental impact. <coughs> so sometimes they, when you choose to build this plant, the location is going to play a role as well. Uh, certain certain flow sheets are just not able to be built in certain countries. When you're speaking with the group that's doing gold mining, you cannot build a cyanide gold, uh, 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 sorry, a facility that uses cyanide to extract gold in, for example, um, what's the U.S. state? Uh, I don't know where it is on the map. It's down there. Um, oh, it comes to me. Where, where you ski? Where Vail and Colorado? Colorado. Yeah. So there you can't, uh, you can't use cyanide in that, that state, they prohibit it. So any technology, any flow sheet that uses that cannot be used over there. Um, so the environmental conditions take, are an important piece of information you need to, to set your design specifications. Anything else you need to set your specs in? for your inputs, yeah. Where am I going to buy my feed stream from? What is its purchase price, its purity, the hydrocarbon stream that I'm coming in with? So environment impacts the fan location, there's influence, if you're you know, buying products, uh, there may be restrictions on those. Also, what about the future? processes will last 10, 15, 20 years, maybe more. Most chemical plants will go on for much longer than that. So when we're designing it, we're not just designing for right now for the required flow of products and the required selling price. We also have to think about the future of that. What might be the future demand for this product? What might be the future selling price? This is why we look at the sensitivity analysis in the NPV. One of the key issues in that sensitivity analysis is my production, the selling price. The lifetime of the plant is also a sensitivity parameter that you can look at. So how many years do you, do you use this equipment in this process for? So those are, those are important in that very first step. Now let's take a look at the process technology. Now we're getting into the flow sheet of it. We've got this information. Let's take a look at, at what, what do we mean by selecting the process technology. to screen alternative technologies based on the fact that, for example, like you gave there with separations, there's many ways to we can achieve a certain type of separation. What are the alternatives? If it comes to my reactor, do I use a fixed bed or do I use a fluidized bed? So we've got in that ethylene plant over there, you'll, you'll see your reactors coming over there. And you could very well choose either a fluidized bed or a fixed bed reactor. And that's going to impact some of the ways that you operate the process in the future. It can give you more operability or less operability, depending on how that's, how that's set up. So we're looking at, at some of those alternatives then in that second step, which is to set the process <coughs> technology. Different separations, different ways of reacting the product, different flow sheets and patterns that exist for, for really essentially achieving the same goal. Then the third one is we start to look at, let's take a look at different structures for the process. What do we mean by that? It's very, um, this flow sheet here has got some interesting structural things that you can consider. One, for example, is this recycle that comes back at us. Why is that recycle being added there? 
why have I got these bypasses? If I take my, my, my reactive products, I've taken off the bottom stream, so now I'm, left, I, I'm not interested in the bottoms, I'm interested in the lighter ethylene stream, which I'm now going to go through compression and refrigeration. Why do I have these bypasses across those units? Why do I have the recycles? This is what we mean by the structure in the flow sheet. So that's, we, we've selected the reactors, we've selected distillation columns as our, as our method of, of compression, uh, as separation over here, and we've got other distillation columns as our separation. But how we start to connect these units together is now a far more, um, almost a creative step. Why is that chosen, and, and what benefit does this get us? Okay, we're going to look at some of that coming up on the recycle streams and bypass streams, how they give us a additional flexibility and they increase our operating window. So I'm going to start to slowly introduce new terminology here. Where these these uh, tools such as flex, uh, the bypass streams and the recycle streams, they expand the operating window. They give us a wider range over which we can operate. Okay, so. So these are things actually that we have learned about in your second year and third year courses, but we may not call them by these names of flexibility and operating window. And you may not have always understood why we're just why why we just put in recycle. We've often just told there is a recycle, but we haven't really seen why and the other engineering goals that we achieve by adding recycle that it, it, it assists us. So in terms of the timeline here. We, we go from a very basic goal down to a more and more detailed flow sheet. And then you get to this part that you'd love to do. You'd love to just go to Aspen and ISIS and you start to simulate it. You do this in MATLAB and you simulate parts of your process. What is it that you're looking at there when you simulate? Why do we do these simulations? And what might be some of the things you look at when you're doing that simulation aspect? So you're evaluating the effect of flow rate changes, different alternatives. Uh, you could also specifically consider alternative reactors, different reactor technologies. So you can see how this is almost coming back up to this point here, when you reevaluate that, you keep coming back at every one of these steps, you, you iterate back again. So our simulation is never just the base case simulation. Okay, that's the key point here. We don't just say, here's my process at the base case simulator. When you're doing these simulations, you're trying alternative feeds to the process. What if I put in different, where is it? Are uh, we also considering the inputs? different purity feeds. What if I have to operate at 50% throughput through my process because there's an economic downturn? Okay, so the people that are doing the biotech plants, they're familiar with that. The, the company has three reactors. They turned two off because for a period of time there was no demand for that product. So the choice of having three reactors in your flow sheet, it may seem inefficient. Why do I have three smaller reactors instead of one big reactor? But that buys you this additional flexibility so that you can handle fluctuations in throughput in your process. And you probably would have only discovered that from the simulation step. If you had initially decided to have one large reactor, and then when you do your simulation, you say, well, how does this process work when I'm operating at only 50 or 40 percent throughput? You may have realized that you don't achieve the required conversion in that single big reactor. You, because that big reactor cannot operate efficiently at 40 percent throughput. So you say, well, let me split up those reactors down to two reactors, or three smaller reactors, and I can operate one of them at 100% capacity, and then still, and then sufficiently get my my product. So simulation is never just the base case; it's always trying a variety of um, scenarios. Cooling water fluctuations in temperature, simulated in winter, simulated in summer. We so expect that variability in our cooling water. Expect variability in the pressure of our steam. Um, so, so those are all simulated. Then we get to the design step, right? And we say, well, we've considered this base case and we've considered this variety of disturbances that impact the process. Now let me design a single piece of equipment that can handle all of this. This is where the, the really hard part is. 
it's, it's the same as automotive engineers who have to design a car to handle a variety of conditions that the, that the driver has to drive in. We have to design a single chemical process that can accept all this incoming variability and still operate well. Okay, so then in terms of the time frame, now this is maybe a year or two that we can even get through this level and then to construct and start the plant. By this time, the process economics and the situation that you considered back up here when, you were, when this was just a conceptual idea are very different. So, so there is a, a very long time delay for most processes that's in the order of years before you go from the initial step to the final step. So, so this is exactly where the inconsistency is because in many cases you may have naively just simulated your process or designed your process for one particular operating point. But it's clear now from the discussion we've had that we have to consider a variety of these operations. So this inconsistency is resolved by iterating through this cycle many times. As you come down here, you realize I'm not capable of handling a certain disturbance that I, I proposed or, or plan to accept. Let me redesign my process. So this is also where experienced engineers, they will, when they're designing their process, they actually will account for all this variation and, and build that in already at an earlier stage. If we're just starting off new, we will go through this iterations several times as we, as we, as we learn and gain experience. Okay? So it's important actually in this class to, to pay attention to this because when you start working, we often don't have the time to make mistakes. We don't want to get down here and construct our plants and realize it's under, undersized. Okay, we want to make sure we get it right the first time because it, to go retrofit and add on is extremely costly. Okay, so, so this really just summarizes what I said over there. We look at each one of these steps. And so in your, in your printed notes that you have in front of you, you have some of that uh, written out. Okay, now I'd like you to take a look at that flow sheet again. And we're going to consider specifically the sources of variation. And these sources of variation come from five major areas. We're going to look at it for this ethylene plant, but like, as I said at the start of the class, also consider what these mean in terms of the project you've selected for your SEL. So we said that we want this plant to operate under a variety of, of conditions. So a specification that address a range of conditions. What are the causes of the deviations? So why do we deviate from base case? Okay, so for those of you that have taken my 4C stats course, you know that I throw up a slide here at the beginning and say how boring life is without variation. Right? If we were all clones and we all looked identical, it would be awful. If we were able to produce a chemical plant, a made of chemical plant that operated day in and day out with no variation, <coughs> none of us would have jobs. Only the people who designed that plant would have a job. But if you could create a plant that had absolutely no variability in it, you wouldn't have a job. So we, we have to know and accept these deviations, but let's take a look here in a bit more detail what causes these deviations. So the first thing I want you to think of is look at that floor sheet there in front of you and consider what are deviations caused by the operator. Where would the operator, anywhere in that flow sheet, not just at the feeds and not just at the product end, but anywhere, where would the operators cause deviations? And, and why might they do that? And by operators, I don't just mean the person sitting in the control room, it's also you as the engineer would, would be the cause of that because you're telling the operator to implement that change. So why do we, as, as operators of the plants or engineers in the plants, um, cause deviations from base case? source of variation. Any, any thoughts on that? Maybe if you're running some tests to try to see what you're doing. So we're doing DOE, of course. 
<laughs> you're doing tests, you're doing it as a design experiment. So DOE, or that's facetiously, you're doing tests, you're intentionally manipulating the process to discover a new operating point. That might be one way of, of one, one source of variation. But what other sources of variation can we consider even prior to this plant being built? Weather and environmental factors are these, but these are we're, we're looking specifically at variation introduced by the operators or by the engineers. We'll come to that one in, in one of the next segments of um, variations. <coughs> They may adjust the recycle ratios. And why why would we do that? If we adjust the recycle ratio, what is the intended effect of that? We're manipulating essentially the purity coming out of so the conversion achieved by a reactor or the purity. Driving those new procedures. Okay, safety standards change. Okay, so maybe safety regulations or operating procedures are being tried out. So these are intentional changes being being implemented. You could have like two different, completely different products you trying to make. Great. So you're switching between alternative products. Yeah. call that a, a grade change often. <coughs> so we're implementing the change from, um, so say, from one grade of polyethylene to a high, higher grade of polyethylene. On, on not on this flow sheet, but on, on another flow sheet, you would be considering alternative grades, and you're implementing a number of changes throughout the process to transition from that one grade to the other. And one of the interesting areas of research is how to get that grade transition to happen really quickly. So you produce less off-spec product uh, in that period of time. Because obviously that period of time, if you're not, uh, you're not either at the, lock, at the one grade or the other grade, you're throwing that product away. So you want to minimize that, that transition time. But to do that, to make that transition, you're intentionally introducing changes into the process. That's a, that's a good one. Another? So plant maintenance. So those those decisions are, are intentional changes. Um, let's see which other ones I have here. Yeah, I think I pretty much have most of those. Heat flow rates. Um, we may have limited inventory um, available to us, and so we need to. If we've got limited inventory available to us, we want to drop down the throughput in the process so that we don't run out of inventory by the time um, we expect our next delivery. So that might be an intentional change. Or it might be an economical change, as I said before. We've decided to reduce the capacity in our process because there's less demand for our product. So, uh, so it's just simply just to make a fee for essentially this one. We reduce our production levels to match our expected sales. We don't want it to produce a whole lot of product that we're not able to sell. Let's take a look then at uh, some disturbances. These are variables that we don't go change intentionally, but they still change on us. So we call them, as you've seen in your 3P course, we call these disturbances to our process. What are sources of disturbances that would impact Particularly this ethylene plant. Changing raw material. So changing raw material, the composition of it. That's something that's beyond our control, especially if we're purchasing our raw material on the open market. So oil on a tanker from Saudi Arabia gets bid on while that ship is traveling across the ocean, and you simply accept what you get if you if you've got 
you can't be as picky as you'd like. So you, you know the, the grade of that oil, you purchase it, and you simply accept that variability coming into your process by the time it's delivered. So we have this unintended change happening to our process. Incidents, so safety or accidents or so those disturbances are we, we don't want those. So safety issues that have occurred. Anything else? Rainstorms and extremely hot days and extremely cold days have tremendous impact on a plant, especially those plants like petrochemical refineries where all the equipment is outdoors and uncovered. So it's, un it's well known that a chemical plant, you can see a rainstorm coming, and the whole process flow sheet, uh, sorry, the whole uh, control room, all the temperatures start to change as the ambient conditions adjust, and the moment that rain shower hits that distillation column, <coughs> it's just taking a whole whack of heat out of the column that would have otherwise been inside it. So you simply you see on your on the screen in real time the effect of that rain shower. Because your feedback control system is then now kicking up and providing the extra heat that's being taken away by the water. So we expect these disturbances from ambient changes in the weather to affect our process. Can we handle it? Right? So if we've only designed for base case, we may not have sufficient capacity in our reboiler to provide the necessary energy in a situation where we've got an extreme cold front or an extreme weather system passing through. Okay, and we're not going to shut down our process because of the bad weather. We want to keep operating our process during that time. So can we handle it? Um, in a similar manner as, I, as the example I've given before, the, heat, the cooling water that's in the process. Normally that's at 20 degrees C, but on a, on a really cold day, on a really hot day, that can swing up and down by 5 to 10 degrees C. So you, now you've got a number of heat exchangers that are relying on this cooling water being at a certain temperature, but it's now warmer or colder. So again, can we, can we handle that set of expected service? This is a, an interesting one, and it ties in with the idea of um, simulations. We've got excellent models for our processes, um, and they get better and better each year. It's phenomenal how accurate some of these process models can be compared to reality. But there are some issues with them. So we always have to be aware that our models have some limitations. They're never, they're never going to be perfect. As, as there's a famous quotation that models are not useless. They're, they're models, all models are wrong, but they're useful. Okay, so that's a quote by George Fox, paraphrased slightly. But essentially, it, it comes down to the fact that, yes, we realize that they're going to be useful for us, but there's some limitations to that model. So, for example, the model may not have taken heat exchanger fouling into account. We've assumed a brand new heat exchanger with 100% area available to us, but essentially that heat transfer area gets reduced in capacity with fouling over time. So that imperfection in the model uh, needs to be built in. So there's a number of a number of those that come up. So heat exchanges would be one fouling equilibrium rate constants that we assume to be known with a high degree of accuracy or not. <coughs> Um, rate constants. So if we underestimate our rate constant, we could oversize our reactor. We could spend more money than necessary if we if we've, if we've underestimated our rate constant. Or the converse could also be true in, in some situations. So how can we compensate for that in our process? We're going to see a bit of that in, in the flexibility section. Okay. Catalyst deactivation is another one that we should consider as a model mismatch. We often consider our catalysts to operate in some normal condition, but there are those catalysts foul and, and change over time. Or the opposite is, if you've just regenerated your catalyst, it may be more efficient than you've previously assumed. So we're going to have a range of those deviations from model mismatch. I guess here's what Nicole mentioned earlier, is that when things go wrong, um, your heat exchanger starts to have a leak in it, um, the pump breaks down, Especially in processes where we're dealing with heavy slurries and, and those pumps are going to break down. So what do you do? If pumps are known to fail in the process that you're pumping the material, how can you, how can you compensate for that? 
How can you improve your process's operability? Redundancy. Redundancy, parallel pumps. Um, you could put them and in more or less sophisticated method manners. So you could simply have two pumps in parallel with the second pump turned on manually. Or you could instrument it to have the pressure sensor so that the second pump comes on automatically the moment the first pump picks up, depending on the time effect that you have available to handle it. So redundancy is something we commonly see. Uh, not just in chemical processes, we see it all over. So aircraft flight systems are installed triple redundant systems that are entirely independent of each other. NASA space shuttles are five times redundant um, with, their, with their communications. So we, we expect this sort of thing in, and we go to higher and higher levels of redundancy the more and more critical things are. We are going to learn how to quantify this a bit as well in this section on reliability. And then finally we get um, some unplanned incidents happening. What if the operator goes up to that valve that's manual and shuts it off? What can we do to prevent this from being an issue? It's going to happen. We all make mistakes. But what can we do to, to make this less catastrophic Less of an issue. It's all about tomorrow and safety systems. Yeah, so if that valve it's going to get closed manually by the operator, we need to make sure that the effect is not catastrophic. So we'll identify that during our hazard vulnerability study as being as being one of the issues. And then we either implement an alarm or a safety interlock system, or if that valve is say on a flash tank and you've closed your, your, your vapor stream outlet, you're going to build that pressure in there, you want that relief valve to kick in. So depending on, on the severity of it, and you, you add in either one of those alarm systems, safety interlocks, or relief and containment to handle these errors that are going to occur. Uh, so this topic of human error and the one prior to it when things go wrong, equipment malfunction, we saw a lot of that in the, in the BP study in the safety video, things going wrong and they tend to go wrong at the same time. These get picked up or should get picked up in the hazard and operability study. And then we, we provide redundancy and, and relief and sensors for that. Okay. So, Essentially where we are here is we've, we've recognized these, let's just backtrack how we've, what we've covered today. We've looked at the design process in a, in, from the beginning from a very conceptual point of view. So you've got this idea of what you want to achieve given a certain feed. And we go through more and more details of designing that process, adding things like recycles and bypasses, designing those reactors, you're making choices, fixed bed, fluidized bed, do I use a membrane separator, do I use a sedimentation tank? I've got all these alternatives. And we iterate through those. But then we get to the next step. We say, well, let's see how this flow sheet is going to handle these sources of disturbances. So we covered five disturbances that are going to, um, or five sources of variation, I should say. Um, changes that are made deliberately by us as people, changes that are made by the environment, disturbances, when we have mismatch in our models, that plays into the, the simulators as well. Um, when we have equipment going wrong, and when we have got people making things go wrong. So all of those are sources of variation. What we're going to look at next class is how we can compensate for all of those sources of variation. And we're going to look at those in the topics, in the broad topic of terminal operability. How do we make our process more operable?